So the college baseball season has officially come to an end and we have our winner, the LSU Tigers, are your 2023 national champions in the baseball world. What's up? Welcome to College Baseball Done Better. I'm Greg Leonard. That's Johnny VTV. Johnny, say hello to the people. What's going on, baby? Uh, great season, man. I'm just, uh, you know, we got a little bit more work to do on that front. Uh, it was a it was a crazy year and you know, it, it made it more enjoyable to be doing this with you every week. It certainly did. And we are presented by the Better Sports Network as well. Don't want to forget that. Jared Moore is pushing the buttons behind the scenes. We always appreciate him as well. Uh, but, Johnny, it was, you know, it was a team in LSU. And, and before we started the show, the one thing that went kept running through my mind as LSU was pointing to their ring fingers all game long as they destroyed, destroyed the Florida Gators in that final game. I kept thinking how you were telling me that the, the LSU Tigers were not that good. Well, the Ockenhauser, whatever that guy's name is, that didn't go well as, as Florida dismantled them 24-4 to in game two. But boy, oh boy, Ty Floyd was really, really good in that first game. And then that Thatcher Hurd came out big in game three. Jack Caglione did not have it. And as Florida was set up beautifully with all of their pitching – they could just not. They just could not get the job done. Big time. Hats off to LSU. Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, LSU was the favorite coming into the year. They're pretty much the favorite the entire way, uh, with the exception of like a late push from Wake Forest towards the end of the year. But when you look at it, LSU had one big weakness that we talked about all season long. It was their pitching behind Paul Skeens. They weren't getting. They weren't getting anything meaningful, anything consistent from their other guys. Ty Floyd, who's their second best pitcher, you know, had his moments where like he was it'd either be really good or to be really bad. Their bullpen was was garbage. Uh, Thatcher Hurd had a lot of bad outings and, you know, really headlined by the walks. And that was the primary concern. But at the end of the day, you know, the pitching showed up. They got what they needed. Uh, you know, it's it's really mind boggling. But this is what championships uh, championship teams do. And. You know, they really they really showed up and they were able to come back from a, a two nothing deficit against Wake Forest, which, to be honest, was really heartbreaking because Wake just I felt like gave it away. And then Florida had Brandon Sproat on the mound. He couldn't really deliver. I mean, he minimized damage. Waldrop wasn't good. Caglione wasn't good. They were set up really nice to take the stranglehold. And ultimately, the championship in this series over the weekend. But, you know, unfortunately, that's just the Jekyll and Hyde of Florida's pitching. And LSU deserves a lot of credit. They uh, they have the championship DNA. And Jay Johnson is a great head coach. He pushed a lot of the right buttons. And they came up in the big moments, and Florida did not. So you have to tip your cap. And I, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that. 75% of LSU's core guys were via the transfer portal and how much it helped them and really not only helped them win a championship, but blueprinted how in this new day and age of college sports, how that will ultimately help other teams stack up their roster in the future to compete for these championships. Yeah, it is something that's ever prevalent, and we're going to get into a little bit more of the transfer portal coming up in a little while. But let's put a bow on this thing. And, uh, you know, one of the guys that was super impressive for me just watching this series, Johnny, was big old K Beloso. I mean, he's the guy that, that Jay Johnson, you just talked about him. They led him off in that game, uh, in game three, which was crazy. He went three for five in the first game with a run and two RBIs. Didn't have a great game, too. Nobody did really for LSU. They lost 24-4, to four, obviously, and then came back in the final game, went two for five with a run and two RBIs as well. To me, he was he was super impressive. I know there's Dylan Cruz and there's Tommy Tanks and he had a bunch of RBIs and things like that, but Cade Beloso was one of those unsung heroes for this team as they, uh, they went on their run. So in a championship team, obviously your stars have to play, but that's not – always enough yeah. you got to have some of these guys that come out of nowhere and Cape Beloso had a great year before the college world series I mean to be honest I think we should be questioning you know his his age because he, <laughs> he would be like growing up he'd be the guy that in a travel tournament where you have to provide like birth certificate that 
we would really be questioning if this kid is of age to be playing. I, I mean, he looks like he's 40 and been divorced three times. But, yeah, this kid was was awesome. Uh, and, you know, much to my chagrin, really got to give credit where it's due because the onus after Cruz, Trey Morgan, Tommy White, it was going to fall on some of these other guys to produce. And Cade Beloso is one of the primary you know, culprits that you really would call on if, if you're the Tigers, that you needed him to, to produce and create opportunities for LSU to score runs. And he did more than that. And, and if we're being honest here, Cade Beloso had a real legitimate claim to being the tournament's most outstanding player. Obviously, Paul Skeens was phenomenal. Nobody's going to bat an eye that he got it because he, he lived up to the billing, especially against Wake Forest when they went against Rhett Lauder. But at the end of the day, he didn't even pitch in the College World Series finals. And I think that's more of a, an award just to an ode to how great he was. Fine. But if we're being honest, he shouldn't have got that award. Cade Beloso or Ty Floyd was probably the primary candidates to get those awards. But it, it's hard to do it when uh, – you have to go against a guy of, of Paul Skeens' caliber. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Like you just said, that Paul Skeens didn't even pitch in the College World Series finals, and LSU still was able to win. Now, what do you credit that to in terms of is it was it just LSU's hitting was just way too good and way too powerful? Um, you know, versus Florida's pitching, or was it just a, a letdown on Florida's part? Their offense couldn't match what LSU could do. Was it the others that that uh, that that pitched for LSU that were most important and, and most impressive? What was the biggest aspect as to why LSU won this series? I think it's a little bit of everything. I mean, when you look at it, it's kind of funny. Game two and game three was pretty much the exact same script, but for the opposite team. Now, Florida won game two. Why? Not only because of the home runs and the base hits, but they were getting so many free passes. And as we know, walks almost always come back to kill you. They win 24-4. to four. Then what happens? The next game, last night, the same thing happened. I mean, Caglione let off the game hitting Cade Beloso. He, he issued three walks, four walks. The, the next several pitchers that came in were delivering walks and – uh, hit batters, and there was a couple errors or defensive miscues. And eventually, when you keep giving a team like LSU chance after chance, they're going to break through on you. And it was really depressing because White Lankford, bottom of the first, hits an absolute piss missile over the fence, gets him a 2 nothing lead. Caglione, back to work, top second. They give up six runs. You give up a six spot, that demoralizes you. And a guy like Thatcher Hurd, who we've mentioned, he's had his struggles, but this was a very talented kid coming over from UCLA. We didn't see a lot of him last year because around mid-April, he had a back issue that kept him out for the entire second half of the season. But when you really look at it, this kid is an elite arm, and he's still young. This is a guy coming into the year I thought was really primed to be a top-five draft pick in 2024. And when he's on his game, he's tough to hit. And, and, you know, in that regard, when you're playing from behind like that and a team like Florida who has the mentality that they always have to hit home runs, they don't understand that, like, the walks and the base hits and, and just trying to hit to contact is going to do it for you. And that's, I think, a problem in today's game where we're teaching launch angle and exit velocity and all this other crap that wasn't there when we were when we were coming up. I think ultimately Florida really just lost sight of playing small ball, putting the ball in play. And when you're trying to keep barreling up guys that have the stuff like her does, that's really going to hurt you. And, you know, in terms of Florida's pitching too many free passes, that's what it comes down to. And, you know, the thing that made Florida so successful in the college world series, because remember, LSU and Florida, to me, were, were pretty much the same team in, in the fact that their bullpens are extremely shaky. Now, of course, you know, Florida had Brandon Neely, who was an All-American closer. But at the end of the day, Florida's success was coming because they were getting six, seven, or eight innings from their starters, all of them. Neither, none of their starters made it five innings. So that that's a big issue here. Now you're putting a lot of pressure on your bullpen, and you keep doing it over the course of a weekend. 
because none of your starters are giving you length. And that's kind of what I was talking about before the finals round when Florida was playing TCU and Oral Roberts. And, you know, that ended up coming back to bite them. And I think had LSU had that for one more game, it would have cost them. So, you know, I feel like in that regard, the theory was there. They just weren't getting the results that they had been, and they were relying too much on their bullpen. And their bullpen was not the strength of their team. Only a team like, I would say, Tennessee and Wake Forest were really built to withstand bad starting outings consistently. Yeah. Nobody else. Yeah. LSU and got exactly what they needed in, in two of their three starters. They did. And, you know, I, I was going to bring that up that the, the, the three big, the big three for Florida, Brandon Sprout, four innings, two runs, five walks, as you alluded to, seven Ks. That was the game that they needed to win there. But unfortunately, mm-hmm. Ty Floyd put on his, his Superman cape and, and he just rode out there with 17 Ks. Hurston mm-hmm. Waldrip, two and a third, three, three earned runs, six walks, only two Ks. And then Jack Caglione didn't even make it out of the second inning. Six earned runs, three walks, and two Ks. When you have your pitching set up like that and LSU doesn't even throw Paul Skeens, I mean, hats off to that LSU offense. And the uh, the, the Florida pitching just dropped the ball in that, that final there in the Men's College World Series. All right, John, before we get out of here, uh, let's talk a little bit about this huge news that dropped literally on Tuesday about Chase Burns officially entering the transfer portal from Tennessee. It had been sort of floated out there over the weekend, and then it became official on Tuesday. Kendall Rogers of D1 Baseball reporting it. Others from you know, around the, the, the program reporting it. Tony went on 99-1, the animal there in uh, Knoxville, and talked about it as well, how Chase was going to be gone, and they didn't expect him back. And kind of surprisingly – it had been known for a while within that organization, within that program, that he wasn't coming back. Kind of a surprise to all of us, but give us your thoughts on uh, on Chase Burns entering the mystical, magical transfer portal. You know, it's really sad. I mean, obviously, we're, we both love the Volunteers. Uh, I'm a big fan of Chase Burns. I really, I watched him a lot last year as a freshman. I thought that kid was special. I still think he's special. I, I think. Top, another one who's top five caliber, maybe top three next year. I mean, we're looking the first. There's ten guys that come to mind for the 2024 draft class that I would I would really put in the top ten, but I think Burns is definitely capable of of the three spot or the five spot. The polish isn't there yet. We saw it last year towards the second half. We saw it a lot this year as a starter. Now I think the only explanation that I have, Burns didn't feel right about going as as a reliever. Which, to be honest, I don't think it was a punishment. I, I, I think this was something that was a very innovative move by Tony V. It's ballsy because, you know, you're taking out one of the best arms in the country and putting him in as like a utility hybrid role. And you're putting in Andrew Lindsay as your Friday guy. But it worked. It saved, it saved their season. The whole thing. And if you look at Burns' numbers as a reliever, he was unfreaking believable. Him as a starter, it was a lot of it it was a lot of um struggles, but there were so many mechanical things that he was just not executing on. I mean, you looked at so many times he walked a ton of batters as a starter. He had a couple outings where he looked good and like come the third time through the order, he would just fall off the table. And, you know, I, I feel like in that reliever role, he he found something. Now, it, it kind of brought up to the point where this kid right now has the makings of a major league closer, but that's not what he wants. He wants to be a starter and rightfully so. But I, but I don't, don't think that's something that he should have said about the transfer. I, I don't know what else it could be. Maybe something else behind the scenes that's going on, but this is the guy that's going to step into the Friday night role next year for Tennessee with Drew Beam coming into the Saturday role. I, I don't really know what went into that, but what I do know is Chase Burns doesn't need Tennessee. He's going to be a first rounder next year regardless. Tennessee doesn't necessarily need Chase Burns because this team is always so deep in pitching and they recruit really well. That being said, where is Burns going to go? I don't know. 
TCU is already making moves. They got two way star Peyton Toll from Wichita State, a guy who's very unsung because he plays for a, a middle of nowhere team w- with uh, Wichita State. They uh, they're making other moves. So TCU is definitely on the radar. Vanderbilt maybe he's he's a little bit closer from Nashville. Maybe he wants to play in front of the home crowd a little bit. LSU you can never rule out. And now I think one of the things that's really happening in this day and age, like we well, like we talked about, the thing that helped LSU win the title this year was the transfer portal. All this NIL money, all this money these kids are getting now it's out in the open. You don't have to worry about handing a kid. $60,000 in a duffel bag. You know what I mean? So the fact is it kind of becomes a bidding war. So we can't discount how much that plays into it. And, you know, I'm sure there's wealthy Tennessee donors that's more than willing to pony up for him. But I think at the end of the day, it comes down to him not liking that move to go to the bullpen. And I can't say I blame Tony V. I think that was a great move. And I think that helped him in his quest to become a better pitcher. And, you know, I wish Chase Burns nothing but the best. I'm always going to root for him. It just, you know, it hurts a little bit, especially because the volunteers made it so far. You know, duffel bag, happy meal bag, hey, Jeremy Pruitt, whatever it may be in terms of how they wanted to deliver that money. But you're right on, and you're exactly what I was – you said exactly what I was going to say in terms of it has to be that that move to the bullpen. And I could just see – because I played with guys in terms of in college – that, again, at a very much lower level, at the D3 level, dude went out, had a huge year. One of my best friends in college baseball on the team went out, had a huge year as a freshman. Nobody expected it. Came out of nowhere. He was all first team this and all first team that. And he's even told me it kind of went to his head a little bit in terms of he took it for granted a little bit. His arm was tired. He had never thrown that much. He threw during summer ball, came back the next year for his sophomore year, wasn't as effective. Got moved to the bullpen. Wasn't as effective, not like Chase Burns. Chase Burns obviously was amazing when he went to the bullpen. So I think it almost might be a pride thing for Chase Burns where he's like, man, I was all this and first team that and this and everything, you know, all American, whatever, as a freshman. And you're taking me and putting me in the bullpen. And the only other thing that I thought of that could have happened was that Tony V and maybe Frank Anderson, when they made that move, talked to Chase Burns and said, hey, look, We're going to make this move. We're going to put you in the bullpen. It's only going to be temporary. want you to kind of find your stuff again. And then once you do, we'll put you back into the rotation. And maybe once Andrew Lindsay came in and started pitching really well, they were like, well, this is working pretty good. And Chase Burns out of the bullpen is working pretty good. Let's just leave it as is, and we'll go from there. And maybe that's what made Chase Burns unhappy. Again, all speculation on my part. I have no idea if any of that's true. But just me trying to think through my baseball mind of like, okay, what could have caused him to really want to transfer? That's another level to it. And you mentioned the NIL money, and LSU will throw that around like nobody's business. Will Wade would do it illegally, but now it's legal, so they can do that there. And uh, Tony V talked on 99.1, the sports animal in Knoxville, earlier in the week and, and said basically like, look, when it comes to recruiting, if money is your top priority, you're not going to get recruited here. That's not what we are going to do as a baseball program. We want you to come here because you want to be here. Yeah, you might be able to get a little bit of you know money on top of everything, but that's not the number one reason why you're coming here. You're coming for the culture, you're coming for the university, and you're coming for the pedigree of the program to learn and develop as a player. And that's exactly what they'll be able to do after Chase Burns. So if he doesn't really want to be here, deuces to him, best of luck. And the Vols will be just fine without it. I think, you know, you, you made a great point there. And I think ultimately that's what's going to happen. Tony V, from from things I've been reading from guys like Kendall Rogers and some of the reports out there, some Tennessee beat reporters, this was a discussion during the year. This wasn't really a surprise move, at least from what Tony V has said. He kind of expected Chase Burns to be, you know, flirting with the transfer portal come the end of the year and – I mean, listen, Tony V is not a guy that he's not going to, he's not going to beg you to stay. If you don't want to stay, there's the door. I mean, this kid is, this guy's turning out pros, dude. Look, look, look how many guys he had on last year's team alone that got drafted. And a couple of them are going to be probably impact players in, in within the next three to five years. He's got a couple more. He's got Chase Dollander coming out this year. He's going to be a top 10 pick. He's got Drew Beam next year. He's going to be a first rounder. I mean, A.J. Russell, I I think there's really a lot of talent on this team. 
And as badly as he wants them, because, you know, you get a guy as a freshman, right? He's, he's like your baby. You know, I, we, we helped bring this kid up and we helped his career and, and showed him a lot how to be a pitcher. But ultimately, you know, if you wanted, if you want to do this, be my guest. I mean, I don't know where he's going to go. I imagine it's going to be, it's, it's going to be somewhere else in the SEC, maybe TCU. Like I said, I, I don't really know any of these other schools that's offering uh, some money outside of like Vandy and LSU, but it is what it is, man. Point blank. We're going to see this kid's name be called very high in 2024. And, you know, if his polish starts to show and reflect what it was as a reliever, I mean, I'm not going to say he's a generational talent, but he's a guy who profiles as a top of the rotation starter in the major leagues. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens with uh, with Chase Burns and where he'll end up. As you mentioned, uh, as you mentioned, you know, TCU, LSU, whatever it may be. Uh, all right, Johnny, you want to uh, wrap this bad boy up by doing a little uh, MLB draft preview. Yep. Let's uh, talk a little bit about some of the biggest names that we could hear called in this year's draft. Obviously, we saw a bunch of them in this this men's college World Series final. Uh, Dylan Cruz, Paul Skeens, some of the pitchers, some of the Florida hitters, things like that. Give us a little breakdown of what you feel like is going to maybe be the top 10 or some of the biggest names that we should be watching out for in this year's upcoming MLB draft. I mean, this is why, you know, we, we do this, right? I, I talked about it before the College World Series started, how many first-round talent guys we're going to have. Six of the top 10 projected players were, were in the College World Series this year. And it's new to a lot of people. Uh, you know, even some of these major outlets like ESPN, most of these people don't cover it. Most of these people don't know who these players are uh, until this time of the year. So when you look at it, you could we could start bringing this more to light. But this Florida LSU matchup featured first rounders in this year's class and next year's class. Just insane talent. And I would say, obviously, to start off this year, you know, personally, uh, you know from our show how big I am on Wyatt Lankford. Wyatt Lankford is my favorite player in the country as a position player. Dolly's my first, Dolly's my favorite. But I've been saying all season long, Wyatt Lankford is his generation's Mike Trout. And I think it's so reflective. This kid is a barrel daddy. He, he hits tanks, bro. His average exit velocity is like $5 million. He is, in my opinion, and, and this is something that I've also been saying throughout the year, he's really warranted consideration to go number one overall. Like any other year, he's probably number one. But the fact is he's got to go against two studs, arguably the best college baseball player ever, and one of the biggest generational pitching prospects ever. So my opinion is this, and it all comes down to the Pirates and their preference because – I don't think you can make the wrong decision if you're Pittsburgh, but for the number one pick, you know, I would go pitcher because you're not going to find too many Paul Skeenses ever. So you got it. You got to get the pitcher while you can take him. Plus yeah. he's a guy that if they're making a run at some point in the year, you could bring him up. That's something else that we talked about. And then, you know, ESPN gets it and they run away with it. Then they bring of the course. idea. But <laughs> if you're not going to take Skeens and you're going to take an outfielder, then it really just comes down to Cruz versus Langford. And based on what we've seen, especially down the stretch in the big moments, even though I've already, you know, known this and had a hunch, I'm taking Langford over Cruz for one simple reason. The power that Langford has in the big leagues, I would say profiles is 35 plus home runs. He's a guy who can hit for a high average. He can get on base. He is fast. He doesn't steal because that's not Florida's game. He's a pretty good fielder, and he's improving. He's learning how to play center. He did a pretty solid job, if I do say so, uh, at the end of the year when they started putting him in more at, to, to play center field. And the kid's just a leader, bro. He's a dog. And I'm not saying Dylan Cruz isn't. I love Dylan Cruz. I think he's going to be a superstar at the next level. I just think when you compare the two, the big thing comes down to power. I see Cruz is more 20, ceiling 25 home runs. Nothing wrong with that, but – 
For my money, I do think Wyatt Langford is the choice here, and I would imagine he's not going to command as high of a slot value as Cruz would be at the number one. So if you're going to take Langford, I, I think you know he has the best ceiling of any position player in this draft. And ultimately, you do want to take a guy that's on the safer side. Now, I do think Wyatt Langford is, is safe. Not as safe as Cruz, but you want to draft the ceiling, Greg. You want a guy that that could potentially be your next MVP. He, he could be one of the great players ever. And I, I do think that's what you're going to get in Langford. But in any case here, I think whichever order they go, you can't really get it wrong because all three of those guys, you know, they're number one picks, really. They're really all number ones. And then you start looking down the board here. There's a lot of guys that I think are being overshadowed because of the talent in this draft. One of the position players that I've spoken very highly of the last two years, Yohandi Morales, third baseman out of Miami. He's made him incredible strides on the defensive end with the glove, with the arm. But this kid, his bat is, is unparalleled. This guy hit, was hitting over 400 for a good part of the year. He, he has so much power. The ball jumps off his bat. He is an absolute workhorse in the middle of that lineup. Like Miami's team wasn't great. Miami didn't have a great team, but when you have Morales in there, he can put the team on his back and carry you. So I, I think really, and, and I was saying this throughout the year because this kid added like 15 to 20 pounds and he had a really good year in 2022, but he elevated to a different level this year. In my opinion, I think he should be 12 to 15 overall, whether that comes to fruition. I don't know, but I, I'm taking Morales over any of the third basemen in this draft class for sure. Yeah, we'll see what happens in terms of the draft. Personally, if it were me as well, I would go Paul Skeens number one overall because, as you mentioned, those generational-type pitchers, you can't find them all that that much. And Wyatt Langford versus Dylan Cruz, you know, Dylan Cruz is widely considered sort of that number one prospect. Some people believe he'll go number one overall. If he doesn't go number one, he'll probably go number two. And, you know, we'll kind of just have to wait and see how it all plays out. Johnny, it's been a fun year. Uh, I don't know if we're going to come back and do something for the MLB draft, but if we don't, uh, I've, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, it's been a fun podcast, and uh, we'll continue on here talking all kinds of things college baseball. Thanks to Jared Moore behind the scenes all season long, pushing the buttons and uh, keeping us going and keeping us on track. You can find Johnny on Twitter, on social media, at underscore Johnny DTV. And for me, it's at Greg Larnard. Again, this has been College Baseball Done Better. Make sure you follow the Better Sports Network at Better Network as well. Until next time, folks, it's been a blast here talking college baseball with you. Again, I'm Greg Lonard. That's Shawnee BTV. See you next time.